Hello there everyone and welcome back to, I think, episode 11 in TNO, in which we're playing as Big Daddy Albert. Uh, listen to the words all written down. Fader's cold, thin body shuddered inside his dimly lit apartment complex. There wasn't much food to go around for him to eat and he still hated work, but home was home. He could at least stare out and see the fields of his Ukraine, which brought a smile to his weary face, but he was afraid, deathly afraid. His wife and the two sons were still back in Deutschland, and he had no idea when they would come back. Before winter, he hoped, if only before winter. The letter that slid under his door was something he'd only noticed an entire day after it arrived, whereupon he stepped and nearly slept on it by accident. Nervousness ached at his heart when he tore open the cover and read the sloppy Polish, but it was nothing compared to the horrors he felt when he began to actually read it. Mr. Fedia, he muttered under his breath, we deeply apologize for bringing you this set of news, but the Reich has currently put the matter of repatriation on permanent hiatus. His sums dug into his sides. How could they do this to him, to her, to the children? We hope you understand the necessity. We will make sure your family members are taken care of. Betrayal flashed across his face, and in an instant the letter ripped into anger coursing through his entire system as he threw the pieces of paper against the wall, letting out an unrestricted scream as he did so. The Germans left his father to die in a uh, <clears throat> chamber filled with gas for being a suspected commie, while his mother faced a horrible fate at the hands of rowdy uh, N-word soldiers. Rage consumed his mind the next hour, and he barely calmed down the rest of the day afterwards. He never should have expected anything more from the German scum. Oh man, 30%! 30% man! But we're still looking okay. We're still looking okay. Let my people go. Colton Henning had elected to give today's briefing together. Their big daddy's patience was wearing thin, and neither of them wanted to be alone with him when it broke. Still, however, Kiesinga did his best to not glance aside at Von Tresco, silently bidding to him to begin. Von Tresco resisted the urge to scowl and fix his eyes to the wall as he spoke. I hate to repeat myself, but the situation is still escalating. The economies of the Eastern Pact have been some of the hardest hit thus far, and the recent repatriated former uh, involuntary workers are proving especially difficult to keep a hand on. They see the incomplete process of repatriation as yet another attempt to divide them, and as yet another broken promise by our government in Poland, Ukraine, and the Baltic. There have been calls for a general strike against all the newly set up governments. With the ice broken, Kissinger took over. Local police forces are having difficulty dealing with the riots, let alone getting around to forcing strikers back to work. Productivity is unlikely to return to normal until the promises are met or until we can muster enough force against them. And the number of violent encounters between police and protesters have increased exponentially. He shifted uncomfortably on that note. One of the few areas where strikes and riots are being dealt with is Muscovine. Shona's tactics have been unimaginative, if undeniably effective. Anyone foolish enough to start a protest there is dealt with swiftly. Sometimes I wish I could resort to his tactics, which we literally have not. All we do here is propaganda, but now we can implement economic reforms, which is going to be extremely important. The oil crisis is an economic disaster on a, low, on a level not seen since the 50s, and swift action must be taken to stop it. Reforms to our financial sector, our economic sector, and our budget in general will be implemented to slow the bleeding and with luck begin to reverse it, unfortunately. These policies are quite radical by German standards, and the people may balk at such changes, but such as a loss in public support is a necessary sacrifice. They will thank us later. So the effects of the oil crisis will improve at the cost of social tension, which is already zero, so whatever, we will recuperate a fraction of our pre-oil crisis GDP growth which is important because we are 0% right now. And the impact of social tension on weekly stability decay decreases, which is good. Hey, recessive, 40%. It's only minus 19. It can't get any worse, right? All right? Anyways, hope you guys are having a pretty good day. Uh, we got a couple comms to go through as well, which we'll do. Disappear reactionaries, not bad. I'd like to do that. Our commitment doesn't even matter anymore. So, I'm not really sure why we see this still, but we can close out of this for now. Probably until... um. We can do some stuff in Iran, perhaps. So that would be pretty good. We're converting some military factories. We're still building a lot of stuff here. I mean, even though the world's kind of on fire right now, we're still building stuff up. We could cut construction spending, but there's literally no point to do so. so. Uh, but we're doing the European way. The Zollverein, once a greatest, great symbol of progress for Europe and the German economy, now stands as a lead weight pulling us further into the depths of recession. If Germany has been hit hard by the oil crisis, Eastern Europe has been devastated by it. Europe's economic situation is incredibly fragile as it is. Action must be taken to stabilize and strengthen it before it can fail completely. Nobody outside of the most extreme conservative voices call for an end to the Zollverein, but it is obvious that a stern hand must guide these failed economies back to prosperity, if we wish, we wish to ride out the storm safely. Though taking more direct action towards the east will certainly lead to great backlash and increase short-term costs, German dominance is still a very sore spot for our partners. It is necessary to save the Reich proper. They will learn to follow our lead, or we will force them too. Now we're doing that side because I want to get to budget renegotiations. The impact of social tension on weekly stability, stability decreases, which we need immediately. Because I like this one. The economy will prove, but pulling on one rope, which is also nice, but this one I think is just much more important. United response. Handle the oil crust becomes available to the rest of the Zilverine. Uh We're doing this one immediately. 
The oil crisis continues to grind away at our financial institutions, but the initial shock of economic failure seems to be wearing off. Now is not the time to hunker down and bear the brunt of the assault, as our rivals do. Now is the time to lay the groundwork of recovery. The first step has already been laid out, and it promises to be the most decisive move yet. When the oil crisis first tore into the Zolverein, our partners were left no choice but to significantly reduce their contributions to the organization, leading to the precipitous budgetary shortfall, one that must be addressed by rene renegotiating these contributions. The gang hopes to restore payments to the pre-crisis levels. Of course, such contributions in the middle of a recession cannot be gained without giving something in return. In exchange for the restored payments, Germany shall offer to increase its own commitment, achieve de facto parity with our partners. Is this costly? Yes. Is it controversial? Absolutely. Conservatives within the Reich race each other to announce what they see as intentional weakening of Germany's status in Europe. But is it necessary? Absolutely, 100%, and the complaints of the out-of-touch cannot be allowed to hold the Reich back. And we got one more thing here too, that we can do. And drew their plans against us. Oh, boy. Oh, uh, we don't... Oh, yeah, crypto... Oh, implement more reform. Oh, can we do this again? Oh, uh, what are we currently at? 2.9%. That's not bad. That's not bad. 92 billion deficit is better than 120 billion deficit, so... Minus 43. It's... I think this is getting really bad for us. Stagnating? Well, at least the economy is coming back a little bit. Is this, how much is this? Not bad. Alto Ernst Rehm, stared at his TV, hastily perched upon a stack of paperwork. With this belief, he had ordered the device brought in to monitor the situation in his homeland while he ordered, uh, worked his utmost to contain it in his post at Moscow. But the state of solidarity and order he had hoped to see was replaced by what appeared to be an ongoing apocalypse. Constant violence in the streets organized by the Reich's banner stooges, blatant assaults on local party headquarters, prevented only by the brave efforts of the loyal National Socialists. Just what was the world coming to when the legendary Russian heck could be managed better by himself and sure than the Reich's hotline could be by his Speer and his cabal? He fled from channel to channel, each displayed scenes of degeneracy and failure of a magnitude he cannot comprehend. How could the party have failed to this extent? At the time of Speer's victory, he had assumed the events to be a mere blip, that he would either be as swiftly replaced by a more committed national socialist, or himself turn from his path of reform. He nonetheless re remained, and the machine of the party only serving to shield him and his minions from the deposition by appropriating, by appropriating the title of the first and only Fuhrer. Indeed, he was more likely to be to see commitment to the ideals of national daddyism amongst his comrades within the Hale than any so-called Hitlerite back in Germania. The common man's revolution that had been promised was no closer to being delivered now than it was when the war was won. He turned off the TV and laced his fingers together. There was something rotten in the state of Deutschland, and the stench was coming from none other than the National Socialist Party of German workers. He would do his duty to purge dissidents from Muscovine. Then, when his duty was done, he would move west. A subtler touch, but not a light hand. Bleeding the black wound. The Rex Adler shone brightly above Speer as he stood within the Rex, only having recently come off of a long debriefing with Kiesinger and Schmidt. The two of them had concocted a plan to safeguard short term stability, even if it would further tear into the economy, no matter. They had given a plan, and now he had laid out for the party to hear and remember. Members of the Reich's party. All who did not listen before, listen now. I call upon you all today to act quickly in the face of danger. Speer took a deep breath. He were here went another try at unifying the party. As we face a paramount crisis, I have convened with my ministers and charted a course of action going forward. Some of you, especially the more hardliner national daddyists, may consider this as doubling down on the maneuvers we have done to strengthen the German economy. May I cast those fears aside, as I simply say this. A hand shot out to the side, splaying towards the black wall, and its eyes narrowed. Chaos has engulfed Germany or German society. Our people are caught in a frenzy, thinking that the Einheitspact shall crush around them. This, I see, is no fault of our own. Merely the workings of the world around us coming to strip away our self-made opportunity to continue under destiny as masters of the world. However, they were now getting riled up. Speer managed to reel them in, and now we are seeing a far-seeing Reich. And as such, today, the Reichstag will pass a new bill, the Energy Security Act, a law which will ensure that no matter what, our people will receive the oil they need to continue day-to-day -day life. This will be expensive, unfavorable, but in the end, it will stop our people from snowballing into sheer panic. And I, as a far-seeing fear of the greater Germanic Reich, shall overcome and oversee to it that all of Germany shall have their oil. Sieg Heil. Sieg Heil, yeah. Ooh, decisions to improve the economic situation become available. You know, this is minus 43%. Okay, buy foreign oil. Uh, let's see, social tension improves moderately. We like that quite a bit. More debt? I don't give a crap about more debt. But it does not matter that the oil prices are through the roof. The fact remains that the economy and the people must have oil at any cost. Oil is the blood of the industrial world, and without it, we shall surely die. It may be costly, and it may be weakening to place ourselves at the mercy of a foreign power, but we have no other choice if we wish to escape this disaster. Better. Invest in alternative energy solutions. Oh, worsens moderately. Oh, good God. 
Fossil fuels have many benefits, but they have many drawbacks, chiefly the deep ties of international politics as the oil crisis has shown. We cannot allow the Reich to be at the whim of the oil supply ever again by investing into alternative energy sources, such as nuclear, solar, and wind, we can begin the road towards self-sufficiency. 70% chance of improving moderately, 10% significantly, we get a nuclear reactor and stability, but there's a massive chance that the social tension will worsen. We can't do that one. We literally can't do that one anymore because we're already at minus 38, so we can't do that one. Mandated car-free Sundays. Worsens, social tension will worsen uh, significantly or moderately. One of the Reich's greatest sources of pride is the automobile. Mercedes Benz, Volkswagen, Audi, and the like. Unfortunately, these vehicles all require gas and oil, something in short supply. An interesting idea has been proposed, however, that being car-free Sundays. Such a move, while potentially controversial, will certainly cut down on our need for gas in these difficult times, and is that not our main priority? Right now, social stuff is way more important than anything else. Uh, but like I did say, we got some comments to go through. Um, I'm just looking here and anything real quick. Uh, for example, someone has stated in the comments that Speer has the best writing in all of TNO. So far, I'm seeing that it's pretty... That person's not incorrect. It's This writing is pretty good. Like, the storytelling is pretty decent. I mean, obviously, I, we all struggled earlier on zero um yeah um, but like i was saying uh yeah this writing is pretty good uh constantine rojewski in the far east and Amur is has pretty good writing as well but i'll be honest here like with the oil crisis whenever we came to the oil crisis when we're playing as russia or america or any other nation it was kind of like okay this is bad but we can probably get through this maybe except for japan as well but for germany right now for spare the oil crisis actually has an extremely tremendous effect, which I love. Finally, there's an, at least one of these nations really is reeling from the oil crisis. Yeah, we, I played as Borman before, but even then, like, this, this, the oil crisis for Speer. This is what I wanted to see when we actually have an oil crisis in the 70s. This is good. Even though I don't like the oil crisis right now, but, you know, whatever. You know, if it goes back up to zero, minus 18, Yeah, we'll see what happens. Token political reform promises? Uh, increases fascist support, but I don't really care. Uh, we could probably, honestly, use a little bit more stability, just in case. I don't know if it's going to keep going down, so it's better to be safe than sorry. Another comment. Um, yes, other people also said this mod, TNO, makes you sympathetic with the Nazis and the fascists. Yeah, it really does. It really does. While probably most of us are not national socialists, it does make you sympath sympathize with them, so. Especially with what's going on here. Uh, thank you very much. It's only 100 billion in deficit. <laughs> hey, 7.8% 7, 7 though growth. And since it's a bit more than the national debt that we have right now and the interest, we'll be fine. Economically, at this point, we'll be fine. Uh, for this one, what is this? Oh, we're not ready to implement it. So it goes back to zero. The happiness of all mankind. The radio gave a sharp screech as the news broadcast halted. The static of static, the sound of static filled the room. But before a hand could reach over and return it with the noise, it resolved itself into a voice. Speaking in halting tones, the voice was evidently not his native speaker Russian. They were likely reading the speech phonetically with a German accent and had replaced many of the lesser familiar words with their equivalents from Ukrainian or even Polish. Nonetheless, it was intelligible. Me people of Muscovy, in Ukraine, in Vice Russland, of Poland, in the Baltic, this hijack broadcast is conducted by Reichsbanner Schwarzrock Gold. We hear your cries for justice. Your families have been torn apart from the homelands, and their only chance of return has been ripped apart from them by the Reich's efforts to maintain its tyrannical regime. Many of you brave souls have entered a great strike against your Nazi-backed government, and we commend you for this. Would that the people of Germany were as bold as you, for many of them would still willingly maintain the wool over their own eyes. Reich's banner wishes to express its wholehearted support for your struggle against national socialism and the desire for revenge against a criminal government. There are no empty words, however, for the Reich's banner has been spent its years underground accumulating supplies for just this moment. Do you have a friend who has a friend who has committed herself to the resistance? Renew your friendship with him, or for the Reich's banner has begun opening its stockpiles for armed struggles. Take up a rifle and be ready, comrades. The revolution is coming. I think I'll stay home from work today. Crap, I'm not touching that. Social tension gets even worse. I mean, what are we supposed to do, huh? What are we supposed to do? Supremacy or bust? I like that one, but still. Still stagnating. But it's a lot better than what it was. And when removed, we removed some oil production, which actually we don't need more oil. Honestly, we really don't. Good, good, good. Budget negotiations. We want to reread this again. Please go right ahead. But, uh, budget increase, moderate improves, impact of social tension, and weekly stability decreases, which is nice. We can use more propaganda, please. What's the purpose? 
Erhard, uh, sat in the driver's seat. The conference had been dull. Thankfully, the other leaders of the Zolverein agreed to help the Reich. That is why the Zolverein existed after all, wasn't it? To prop up Germany's failing economy, what happens now that the German economy isn't failing? The block still exists, but thank God it does. Without it, the crisis would be much, much worse. But it may need to be changed to fit better fit into this modern age. For once, Erhard began imagining a better future. He'd always opposed the slave labor in the Reich's commissariats. It wasn't as profitable as making them equal workers. Plus, the goods were frequently sabotaged by them, a small act of resistance against an oppressive regime. It had made sense to abolish it, regardless of Erhard's personal views. He was only the one to see that. Erhard fancied himself as a sort of economic messiah to the Reich. If that was the case, then the Romans were the party. Er were the party. Erhard thought back to him and Schmidt's discussion about the crisis in the Reich. The party really did need to go, didn't it? A bunch of reactionaries who de too deluded by pseudo-scientific idealism to solve a larger economic crisis. Erhard shook the thought from his head it would never happen. Maybe. So this will improve social tension. What we're going to do is we're going to do this again. Because at this point, we're at 102. That's good enough for me. 100 is good enough. This is bad. So I'm going to wait for this to get back down to zero first. And then we'll click on this to improve social tension quite a bit more. That is the goal. And my apologies about that. Uh, I think someone came home. I had my door open. But sometimes that happens, so... It is what it is. Also, someone did ask, how did we get social reform outlook to be reformist? It's because I kept spending as much money, ten, every single time it was available. $10 million for the budget, 100 political powers, you do it as soon as you can, and you'll be fine. That's pretty much it. We can hold a speech, but I'm going to save our PP. We might need it later, and we'll get more other stuff to do as well, so we'll see. Cool. And anything else here yet? Nope. I'd like to do this, but we're already pretty good, so. Hey, zero. That's great. 112 and 4. Well, 4 is better than negative 43 like we had earlier. 9.9% .9 is pretty good, though. Not gonna lie, that's pretty darn good. The German way. Austerity, the practice of cutting expenses and programs in order for the government to save money, with hopes of waiting out the crisis. Such methods have been used by the governments the world's over for decades now. And while it certainly does lead to results, the downside is simply too great to be ignored. Germany has already suffered throughout the years of austerity in the 50s, years of economic stagnation, <clears throat> of high unemployment, and steadily falling quality of life. We cannot make the same mistake again unless we slide right back into such a dire state. Germany cannot suffer the way it did. There is a better way of dealing with our economic woes, one of deals, aid, and a careful playing of the markets. By taking a proactive stance against economic failure, we shall stand together stronger than ever while our arrivals are forced into destructive budget cuts and financial withdrawal. When this crisis comes to a close, and one day it will, we shall find ourselves on the top of the economic world with our enemies struggling to recover beneath us. Alright, so nothing else here, because I saw this the decisions tab open up a little bit more. Uh, this one's fine with us for now, I don't care. Uh, vast political promises, no thank you. Employ and Duncan Satellites. Um, we're pretty much done with everything else here, which is kind of disappointing, but whatever. I need to show you Russia as well. I don't remember who's winning in Russia, so. Yeah, I'll do it over them. Do it over them. Cool. Well, it's the Siberian Republic. Kind of cool. Versus the Russian Soviet Federative Socialist Republic. Oh, God, not Zukov. Not Zukov, please. Please, please, please. Not Zukov. Actually, how much deficit do we have? 102 billion? That's still pretty bad. There we go. It's better. German way? Anything else? Um, distribute propaganda. That's what we like to do here. That'll be good. There you go. Seven is not great. Buy foreign oil. Um, social tension improves moderately and de increases, but that's fine. Fourteen, not bad. That's getting better. Uh, we're done implementing economic reforms. Like I said, we're over 122 or 100, over 120, so that's fine with us. A united response. Pulling on one rope. More authoritarian democracy, reformist cause, regime stability, or united response. After months of fighting, we must admit the facts. No nation alone can hold off the sheer power of this disaster. Despite our efforts, we are only able to stabilize the economy at its low point by ourselves, and tenuously at that. To truly recover to pre-crisis levels, we must work together with our European brothers. I apologize for me selecting over here first, but it is what it is. The Zolverein, for its many faults and failings, has provided the perfect ground for continental cooperation. It'll be no easy task to bind together Europe into one response. Decades of fighting and oppression have not made our job simple. But it's an undertaking that we must go through. We must work together as one, or economy, our government, and the progress we have worked so hard for shall... For, worked so hard for shall be in vain. Shall be in vain. Oh, went back down to zero. God dang it. Ugh. Social tension. God dang it. Improved significantly. But... The rate increases, it gets a lot worse. Wait. The rate increases, social tension increases. We don't want more tension. We want the least amount of tension as possible, so. Pulling on one rope. Hard times call for strong men, as the saying goes, and few times threaten to be as hard as the one ahead of us should we fail in our mission. Germany cannot frame, falters a looming specter of economic collapse creeps towards us. All of German society, from the lowest workers to the highest officials, must be pulling towards the gang solutions. Uh, any weakness will cost us dearly if not stamped out with haste. 
Unfortunately, there are many signs of weakness in the Reich today. Party extremists, barbarians who still call for such ridiculous measures as autarky and exploitation of Eastern Europe, still make up a sizable chunk of our administration. If left unattended, they will wreak havoc on our efforts to save the Reich. This cannot be allowed. They must be sidelined, replaced with more men, suited to our aims. Then, and only then, will the Reich truly be ready to withstand the coming storm. And stability is 81%, which is actually pretty good. There you go. And, oh, yes, yeah, synthetic oil sounds really good right now. And bribing enemies, yes, please. And we do hope it gets more stability, too, because of that. So, der Deutsche Weg. Ehart exhaustedly leaned back in his chair as Schmidt paced around the messy boardroom. All right, we can't return to Autarky or anything those party morons suggest. All the, and the people won't be satisfied to the state profits while they remain impoverished. Yeah, hardly forward. We have to do sweeping market reforms to make people see their, their best interests lie in the party and the state, as well as the market. Schmidt stopped pacing. He seemed to have an idea. Eyeing him carefully, Eha continued. They can be satisfied by free market reforms. They'll get richer, we'll get richer, everyone will be happy except those diehard dudes in the party. You know, I have a better idea. Schmidt stared at the floor, lost in thought. What if we just did away with an SDP right now? They'll reject anything we propose for no reason, halting all of our progress. The people can't be satisfied unless they're gone. We can't cooperate with them anymore. Erhard stared at Schmidt, thinking hard. Schmidt stared back. Erhard cleared his throat and spoke. That's insane. Do you really think those brainwashed idiots you call the people will really go along with us dissolving the thing they've been taught to base their entire lives around? Besides, do you really think that we have the power to take them down? Erhard asked. Schmidt slightly smiled at him. Erhard felt himself smile back. The boldest go the farthest, I suppose. It's only 9.9%, but still. I don't think we're going to get any more benefits from doing that, but whatever. Hold a speech. Nah, that's way too much PP for me to spend. There you go. Good. Good. Bug him. Nice. <sighs> this oil crisis, man. At least it's actually affecting us. Can we build anything else, please? I'd love to build more. 12 out of 9, that's pretty bad. Um, 16 out of 16. Da, 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 17 out of 15. I wish we could build in Hungary. We're kind of nice. But yeah, overall. Oh, propaganda campaign ended. Screw it. We're going to keep going all the way. Oh, wait, we have a lot more here. Should we propaganda? I guess we could. It doesn't really do too much for us, though. Buy foreign oil? I guess we can. It goes up to 14, but it keeps going down so much. That's not good. Who cares about money right now, anyways? 90% is pretty good, though. That's pretty darn nice. Um, I guess just social stuff just got to get worse. There's nothing we can really do. Doing this stuff would be god-awful. We just got to grin up and bear it. Um, oh, oh yeah. Kiesling and Trusco sat in a small boardroom. Everyone else had left the meeting when they had adjourned, but the two had stayed. Well, if the Zolverine isn't for the Reich, then who's it for? Kiesinger prodded. The debate, if you could even call it a debate, was well, semi-serious and good-natured. I suppose it's for everyone in it, Trusco said, chuckling a bit. Well, it sounds more like a organization of European nations rather than the Zolverine, Kiesinger laughed. Trusco didn't. My goodness, it's happening. Trusco suddenly stood up, Kiesinger, we might have a chance. With the oil crisis here, it might be possible. I know, Kissinger smiled. I don't want to get my hopes up, but it could happen. It's a wonderful idea. Mutual cooperation between the members of the Zolveron. It could be the best thing that happened to the entire pact. Would really sell the name, too. Tresco smiled, but there's only one problem. The two looked at each other. The party. Tresco sat down again. He sighed. The people hate it. The oil crisis has turned them against it. Everyone's dissatisfied with it at this point. I don't think they'd mind if it was removed. Tresco grinned. Kissinger returned it. It could very well happen. I, as you can tell, we're literally running the things to build here. Like, I want to build more civvies. I want to build civvies and more factories, but no. <laughs> that should take a while to build anyway, so. Hey, if we end up in a war, because there totally won't be any war for us, right? Totally won't. Especially whenever TNO2 comes out. Um, then we totally don't need these forts, right? Uh, oh, there we go. Oh, look at this. This is different. Invest in alternative energy. Oh, that's not bad. Oil has become the lifeblood of modern civilizations, and is the crisis that is showing us just how valuable that lifeblood really is. It's time to invest in alternative energy sources of energy. Introduce rationing. Easy, although painful for society, oil and gas rationing is the most rational countermeasure against the oil crisis. By declaring these limits, we save ourselves valuable time and money, even if our citizens don't like it. Um, oil rationing, huh? Fight systematic issues. No matter the geopolitical events that launched the oil crisis, the very fact that it could come to the situation in our country shows a necessity for economic reform. Hindsight is always accurate. So, when removed, oil crisis will modified will be removed, recuperate a fraction of pre-oil crisis GDP growth. Interesting. Now we have a massive budget. We're not even spending all of it. Which, I mean, to me sounds pretty good, but still. The People's Forum. Democracy is a dying, bitter dream within Germany, but yet it lives. 
The Dead Christ has shaken the superpowers to the core and forced them to all think differently, which has impacted every echelon of the Reich society, from the top brass of the NSDAP down to the forgotten slave in both good and bad ways. As the gang has pulled their weight in this time and attempted to fix the bre breached hole by making sure the economy remains to stay on its own two feet, a phenomenon has occurred. And I apologize for this again. I just want to get through this stuff quickly. There you go. Happy 71. The gang, and especially their unwilling ally, Speer, can see it. In the wake of government instability and a lack of focus towards pulling down internal dissent, the voices swirling around Germany's democratic movement have finally begun to form into something coherent. Political movements, as sporadic and as small as they may be, are starting to appear. Democracy can no longer remain merely a dream. It seems like if we really want to just like curtail like public meetings and declare martial law, we could really end up just causing like a civil war with all the um the voices there and people's anger. Well, that might be a little bit fun. As you can tell, I'm trying to get some of the stuff here. I'm pulling on one rope. That's nice. Uh, and I don't really care if it's ahead of time. Uh, it's a little bit way too ahead of time, though. Uh, there you go. People swarm. Probably another event here. Soon, soon, soon. The wheels turn. 174 billion. The government outreach. The gang shall make contact with like-minded individuals. Social attention will improve moderately. I like that a lot. The National Socialist German Workers' Party is on a legal basis the only party that is allowed to exist. All others have been officially dissolved long ago. This, along with the other policies of the National Socialist Administration, has shattered overt resistance against the government. Only as the world has begun catching fire in Germany's inner pillars, the stability has been rocked and there has been an opportunity for the more bold anti-fascist members to truly begin rallying against the NSDAP and their cronies. They can cannot challenge Speer not yet, but they can begin to undermine him. These, may, these many groups, though scattered and lacking communication, are a valuable asset, and all members of the gang will begin using all of their influence they have built up over the many years of being ministers and perceived allies of the Fuhrer to funnel resources into the last stand against Germany's dark tide. The hour of fascism grows strong as comes. The question of destiny hangs in the air, and nobody is certain how it will be answered. One can only hope that the Hockenkreuz does not rule Europe forevermore. <laughs> now we're only up to 11. Wow, that's pretty bad. Anything else? Probably not, honestly. Probably not. Nope. The People's Forum. Vox Architect. Passive brown curtain, but growing in rust. He's going to drop the file she handed to him. This is... I know, right? It's insane. In the old days, that kind of behavior would have gotten you put in a camp, but now they can just do it freely? Speer ranted as he paced around his office. Kissing nervously looked at Speer. Speer, you just can't mow them down. Don't make them martyrs. All they're doing is demanding more political reform and freedom. Kissing a lean on the desk and tried to hide his enthusiasm. They can probably be talked out of it with token reforms. Re token reform? Do you want me? To, you want to reform more to stop reform? They're starting to deform political parties. You give them an inch and they'll take a mile. Speer shouted. Speer, calm down. It's not like they're demanding you resign. Not yet, anyway, Kissinger. You have to crack down on this. You're fired if you don't, Speer demanded. Kissinger had no choice. He walked out of Speer's office with a sense of dread in his stomach. Kissinger went into his office and picked up the phone that sat on his desk. He dialed up Schmidt. There's some important news, Kissinger whispered. He looked around the room anxiously, trying to see if anyone else was listening. De facto, political parties are starting to form underground. Schmidt was ecstatic. Well, that's, uh, I learned it from Speer. He's suspicious of us. Be careful, Kissinger hung up rapidly. He began writing out some orders. The thought of Speer watching him nagging at the back of his head. It's starting to happen. Past the brown curtain. From the view of the Volkshalle, one could see people packed in the streets almost every single day, carrying flags, waving banners, representing the part of German society that only existed within feverish propaganda pieces set only to demonize them as anti-fascist Jew lovers, and nothing more. Now, with the NSDAP's grasp on public control weakening by the day, more people find themselves emboldened to go out on the streets, from towns of tens of thousands to the landmarks of Nazi domination in Europe or in Germany, all march and demand something more. In their eyes, the concept of change is not enough. Though many, if not most, still consider the dream of a democratic Germany dead in the water, the voices of a large part of the country cannot be denied to the gang. A populace slowly turning against a nation that is now openly bleeding from the wounds with a divided government and cliques of power, and a future that could lead to a thousand different directions. It felt all too similar and familiar. Cool. The reformist cause in the Reich significantly benefits more political power. The Reich is returning to a familiar situation. And my apologies about that. My cat wanted to leave the room once again. Oh, man. This is a little nuts. Oh, we already have 100%. I don't need to click on that then. Oh, well. Uh, good, good, good. Anything else? Not too much. No, I thought it says 16. Hmm. Ah, broad political enemies. We don't really need to do that one. We can kind of hold on to our stuff for now. So, the budget's three quarters of a billion dollars. Not bad. I passed the brown curtain. Of course, what's next? Actually, do we get an event for this one too? Government outreach? No, we don't. Social tension hopefully gets better. Because it's only getting worse. It's literally only getting going worse. 
kind of definitely want to go down the middle route sometime. I'm going to try that one next immediately, too. We'll see what happens. Because I want to see what happens first, and then I'll kind of make some decisions about the future of this campaign and what we do next. So, Alright, 16 still here. Not bad. Um, Nothing there, nothing there. Hey, it's still four. That's better than zero. Volksbund. A secret fear was carried between all the members of the gang. As ashes of the German Civil War resided, buildings burnt down being rebuilt. Fallen soldiers given their grades, and those afflicted slowly returning to a semblance of normal life. They were afraid that the Nazi death grip of propaganda would choke out what was left of a redeemable future. And yet they continued to hope. Years and years down the line, as the thin drew narrower, and the Speer's power grow as his, and the gang sweeping reforms began forging Germany to a new sort of superpower, those who sought freedom from Nazi rule saw a window of opportunity, and the fight in the dark began anew. Then the match was struck, with the coming and going of the economic crash and internal disarray. Alongside the gang's subtle interference, the movement against the people has exploded, to the point where it has grown out of their control. Ludwig Erhardt, Henning von Tresco, Helmut Schmidt, and Kurt Gorg Kiesinger, though they continue to work within and against the NSDAP, watch as Germany's fate draws closer and closer, more rapidly than perhaps one would have expected. The Iranian Civil War, Iran, our largest export of petroleum, has collapsed into civil war. The monarchy is apparently shakier than we gave credit for. With the death of the Shah, his widowed wife has taken over his head of state. The many rebellious factions within Iran have taken the opportunity to use the chaos to their advantage. Baathists, fundamentalists, socialists, and even more have taken up arms in a massive coalition to destroy the monarchy. We need our allies to come out on top. If they lose, we will lose their rights to their oil fields, which will be disastrous for our economy. The monarchists have retreated north and have holed up in the mountains, transforming their occupation into a virtual fortress. We need to make haste and send our assistance at once. They will not be able to hold indifferent without our help. We must secure our new oil reserves, which is very true. However, I did go back, and you see the GDP is not as good as it was earlier. That is because every time we click Implement Economic Reforms, we remove 10 days from the mission, the wheels turn. And my goal is to finish up Volksbund before the wheels finish turning. I want to get that last focus done before we can do this one, and then I'll go back and do economic reform. So right now, our GDP growth, not great. Even though the economy is recuperating quite a bit, so. I've been doing, instead, mandate free car Sundays. It hurts our social status, but our social status is going down anyway, so I figured, eh, who cares. Um, yeah, not too bad. Overall, uh, let's see what down here. So, the Iranian conflict. We'll send weapon shipments. Ship weapon shipments. Uh, Middle East and Flames, anything else here? Uh, Baatists. No, not really. Increase our commitment. No, we're pretty much okay. Victory, 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 victory. Oh, wow. Now it's four. I thought it, was, it said three earlier. I thought, huh? Supremacy or bust. Nothing we can really do down here yet. Industrial aid. Oh, that's not too bad. Barata group of Mittelerhilfe. Not bad either. Operation Rolander Donor. Iranisches Freiwillenkor. Cool. Our volunteer corps, the Iranisches Freiwillenkor, will be our boots on the ground based off the Heroic Africa Corps. These men will be trained to take initiative and be able to function independently from the Vaterland and chain of command. They will be able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with any foe that faces them. Why not? Vehicle shipments? Nah, we're going to give them the stuff that we want to give them anyways. How many give them? Is it three or two now? It's still only two, which is totally fine with us. There you go. There you go. Very good. Nice. Alright, so our planes can... Okay, so we can go up to 30 now. It's better than 20, but still. Cool. And... Cool. Alright, boys, head on in and do the best you possibly can. Um, Command power, they get command power, German organizations. Actually, that's not too bad. Yeah, let's, let's do this for them. That'd be good for them. Uh, you know what? Screw it. Give them the stuff. We want to make sure they win. Now, let's go do that too. Why not? Everything else, I mean, I, I, we're just trying to get this stuff done at this point. So, uh, regime stability is 100%. Don't really care right now. I'm not going to do that stuff yet. Anarchic. Anarchic. Yeah. Anarchic. Yeah, it's not looking so good but at this point. I mean, really, this has not been my main focus of the entire campaign. The economy. Somewhat, you know, somewhat, of course, but still. Okay, so here, I think we're just going to cut through here and d delete these divisions up top first. Oh, we got it done. My goodness. Sehr gut. All right, the day before this expires, I'm going to click on economic reforms again, so. Something changing. They're getting more organized, Kissinger said with a smile on his face, demanding more. I've gotten reports from them demanding elections. The other three members of the Gang of Four all smiled back. It's finally happening. We're winning, Schmidt said. I never thought I'd see the day, Ehad replied, beaming the protest reforms the economy. I always thought we'd get found out and killed. We're not out of the woods yet, Tresco interjected. There's still a long way to go. Don't get too excited. The mood in the room grew sour. There were still swastikas flying outside. Caricatures of Jews and Slavs still lined the walls of buildings. But it could change. It could all change on as 
as if on cue, Speer burst into the room. Kiesinger, his voice snapped the gang of four out of the discussion, and they all looked towards him, suddenly filled with unease. Speer looked more than just uneasy himself. The protesters kept filling the streets and they're starting to ramp up their demands. The Reich seems like it's crumbling down all around me. What the heck did I ask you to help me fix this for? He demanded as an explanation, but judging by the expression on his face, he wasn't expecting one either. With an imperceptible sign and nod, Kiesinger got out of his seat and as Speer motioned for him to leave. He gave the rest of the gang a half glare and stepped out of the room. The rest of the gang stood in silence for a moment, then Tresco smiled and spoke. I think we can start getting inside now, so I'm just going to remove the wheels turn anyways. So I'm not exactly sure how, what the wheels turn do, does anyways, so... Um, this is going to go anyways, so we're going to do this one. Um, oh wait, that's going to take some time. In 10 days, remove 10 days. Uh, give us a little bit of time, alright, and now zero, well... Buy some foreign oil. That's minus 50 days already! Oh well! So I'm not really sure if that was supposed to do anything, so maybe I hurt myself by not doing that earlier, but... Oh well. Oh, oh, that's pretty good. Expand the Bergsjäger program. Yes, please. And then create the Erasmus Bomber Grupo. Uh, we can do some air XP. Why not? We got, we got plenty of command power for this. Why not? How is air superiority doing? Oh, it's doing great. Oh, it's doing great, 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 great. Echo. Tens of thousands of TV sets and radios crackled in explosions of static, with a chatter of frenzied newscasters giving pre-recorded propaganda speeches was replaced by a much livelier singular voice. Those who could see saw a room shrouded in darkness, with only a window beaming down light on a wooden panel below. The buildings outside the sharper eyes they could recognize it. Allen Tribune out in the distance and the Nuremberg was a city. Greetings, comrades. The thick Bavarian accented German came from the shadowy figure holding a beer bottle in one hand and what seemed like a shotgun in the other. Who, you might be asking yourself, is this bizarre assailant haunting my TV and my radio? A hearty laugh escaped his throat as the figure slapped his knee. Let me send you a message, my friends, from the Reichsbanner combating the Reich in the dark, fighting in the name of anti-fascism. Giving himself a cheer, he turned to his head to the left as the sounds of boots slamming against wood and sharp. Out, orders were given, followed by gunshots and screams. Another laugh, yet desperate yet elated. Then, my friends, he looked back to his viewers. Do you see? He asked, voice filling with calm rage. They shoot us, kill us, oppress us, and we will take the standing down? Another round of gunshots this time outside the building, followed by raw, unmitigated screams, a plume of smoke crackling flame rising behind the window. No, so fight, gosh darn it. A bullet shredded wood and a pinprick of light streamed past the bloody cheek. And a hint of a smile in the clever darkness came as a bottle smashed to the ground and both hands gripped the gun, followed by a chunk of the pump. Fight until the very last drop of blood leaves your body and live for the democracy so you may die for freedom. The roar of the gun drenched illumination on its wielder's last moments. And we're here in Iran. Who cares about the current administration? We have Iranians to save. I'd love to do this, but... Well, that thing's gone. 200 is pretty good, actually. So let's come over here and finish these guys off. We should be able to... At least a, a little bit. Actually, what we might want to do is come here first. One, two, three. We can probably move the chop choppers pretty darn fast. They are 20 combo with, so. Uh oh, what's going on? A lot of lag. Oh, the choppers are there. That's nice. Oh, it's auto saving as well, which is fine. And actually, because we did that once, 5.7, that's good. Spy versus spy. Maintaining the flow of information was Vessel's job. No decision should be made without the most complete knowledge of the situation possible. And it was the Reichnachtdienst that kept these channels of information open. Or so we had thought, it seemed Reinhardt had fallen into the old spy master trap, the hoarding of knowledge for his own sake. It was therefore up to Vessel to restart the flow. To the untrained eye, the HQ of the Reich's foremost intelligence agency was just another office building. Cleaners have a unique ability to go unnoticed in a crowded room. All too easy for a loose sheet of paper or a cassette to fall into the bag while its owner was preoccupied. A microphone concealed with a lampshade might be noticed in an office, but nobody would even consider searching for one behind the bowl of a toilet. And conversations became less formal when one has their fly undone. Gerhard now enjoyed the fruits of his labor in his office. The unmarked cassette was playing into the pair of headphones. The fact that this tape existed at all was darning enough, but the contents disturbed him greatly. The recording was a phone conversation at one end, Galen's crackling voice, the other unmistakable tone of their fear Albert Speer. He listened to it in its completion, then removed the film from the tape, concealing it with an empty bottle of pills. Galen was a true rogue agent, agent at the head of one of the world's largest intelligence agencies. Reinhardt was smart and revealed much while demanding nothing. Nonetheless, Gerhardt could recognize a hint of extortion. Truly, nobody was without sin. Gerhardt had known many of the darkest secrets of the Reich, but could only hypothesize whether Speer had been party to them. If Galen revealed anybody he just found, the Reich would collapse in on itself. Speer had buried his past deep, yet Galen found it nonetheless. A stark warning of what he was facing. If he was to act against Reinhard Galen, he must act fast, for the safety of the Reich and his mentor had so clearly forgotten. The man's ego will be his downfall in the squabbles of children. Oh crap. The Reichstag was selling as the man who held the reins of state argued. Over the shouting and cursing from politicians, one could hear more of the same from the outside. What would Hitler think of these riots in the streets? 
Oberlander was in rare form, his face as red as it had ever been. Your system of make-believe economics has utterly collapsed, he hissed at Erhard and Speer. I warned you all of this. I warned you the risk of tying our economy to what the capitalists and democrats of the world over thought prudent. But you did not listen. The door to the box hall began to shake, almost all of its hinges, and the guards quickly moved to hold it shut. The students, the riders, were trying to bust through into the chambers of government. The sounds of gunshots began to ring through the air, and the Reichstag did not know who was firing them. Kissing could try to step forward to sue the situation, but Erhard spoke first, glowing with fury. I'm not the one who blew up the Middle East. If there is anyone to blame, it is our Fuhrer and Hitler for mismanaging the economy so severely that drastic measures were necessary. How dare you blame me for the catalyst of your own mistakes, your own idios idiocy. Speer had abandoned all his calm facade. The Fuhrer was as angry and intense as anyone else in the room. Keep the Fuhrer's name out of your mouth, he commanded. This is no failure of the government. This is a failure of the Reich's elite economists. And they, s and they see fit to sit in this room criticizing the my implementation of their own policies. As attention escalated, no one in the chamber noticed when the door finally gave. With a holler, the riders rushed in, beginning to flip desks over and throw papers to the floor. A few of the bolder protesters grabbed members of the parliament, trying to beat them bloody and raw to avenge the common peoples of Germany. Blood splattered all over the floors of the government. A spear and its inner circle looked on in shock and horror. The Fuhrer, above his madness, gave the order to the scrambling guards, clear them out. The madness of men. As the last rider fled to escape the storm of bullets, the whole of the government's, or Reich's government, was silent. Speer, plastered with sweat, peered down at the carnage below, the massacre he had unleashed. He looked over his shoulder to Kiesinger and Oberlander, whom he expected to voice support. Both were sullen. Did they not understand the necessity of what had been done? Speer began to speak, trying to address the situation. Gentlemen of the Reichstag, we have just seen another example of failure to protect the people. Speer noticed that these men whose job it was to televise the Reichstag sessions were quietly packing the equipment. Stop, he commanded, pointing at them. The German people must see that this was necessary. They obeyed, resuming the broadcast. I tried my best to help to save the people of Germany. Now, for all my laborious efforts, I see that I could have done more. I should have done more. I am truly, truly sorry. Speer looked more panicked than remorseful, but seemed genuine. I've only ever wanted the best for the Reich and its people. Please, I urge you, trust in me as you always have done before, and I will lead the Reich to south. A scream cut through the air. If this is your view of the best for Germany, you are a madman, Schmidt looked incensed. He strode into the center of the chamber, surrounded on all sides by blood and atrocity. He yelled to be heard, his voice raw. What have you done, Speer? He glanced around the room, gesturing at the children who had given their lives to mildly inconvenience their politicians. How are the people to trust you when you shoot them down in the streets? People will trust me because I'm the Fuhrer, Speer shrieked, his face flushed with embarrassment and anger. How dare Schmidt do this in front of the Reichstag in all of Germany? Herr Schmidt, return to your seat. He did not move. Herr Schmidt, I have not given you permission to speak. This was treason. Schmidt was betraying him. Speer glanced around him uh, fearfully. Had this been planned, who else was involved? Helmut, please sit down. Sh Schmidt remained real standing. Or where he was. The Reich is dying. The game is on. Vessel locked the door and swiftly turned to leave. There were only a few select... A few select few who could trust with his information. He could only pray he would reach or it would reach them or before Galen realized what was missing. He marched through the office door of the Bureau of Vessel, giving dismissive nods to those who met his gaze. Excuse me, Herr Katchen, I have a message for you. Gerhard turned to see a man in dark sunglasses. The man extended his right hand with a slip of paper, clearly expecting him to take it. His left was lazily resting in his coat pocket. Vessel reached into his pocket as though reaching for a penny. His, his eyes darted from side to side, establishing the visitor was alone. The man's eyebrows froed, and the corner of his mouth turned as he realized his bluff had been called. Vessel also pulled his penknife from his pocket all too slowly as the man's left hand emerged from his coat pocket holding a slim pistol. In one smooth motion, the man's arm straightened. The oversized suppressor brushed up against Vessel's ear as he jerked it to the side. His detonation nonetheless deafened him and threw him off his balance, and he fell into the sass in a tangle of limbs. A blind thrust of the blade made contact and he stabbed, the knife finally connecting with the man's throat. With a gurgle, the man in his sunglasses expired. Vessel arose, clutching at the side of his head. A bull the bullet had grazed his skull, and from what he could tell, most of his left ear with it. The shot had roused the rest of the bureau, and Vessel had slammed down the telephone of a wide-eyed secretary who was in the process of calling the Orpo. Whatever number was dialed next, Vessel could guarantee it would not be the one <clears throat> that picked up. He barked out or swift orders to leave. His bureau had planned for a situation similar to this, though he had never thought they would be ever be implemented. His staff would scatter and the bureau would go dark. He, however, had a meeting to attend. A spare was compromised. He had to find the next best thing. Exiting through his own secret door, hid in the den of electrical wires and transformers, he turned up his collar, put on his hat, and made for the Reichskanzlei. Herr Meyer, here to see Reichskanzler Kissinger. Oh boy. And we're not doing very well right now in, uh, here, as you can see. But painted black. Cold, hateful eyes pierced the thin air of the Reichstag. It stained a smell of blood, and Schmidt's lips co contorted in a snarl. The others, all nameless party members sitting upon the rows of pathetic silence, were blocked out by his vision, and all he could see was a fool staring back at him. He didn't know what Speer had said, but the sound of his voice cut through the architects nonetheless. I've had enough of this. Herr Schmidt, Speer's voice shot back. <clears throat> Almost immediately, and once again the NSDAP lapsed in pitiful silence. I would advise you to cease this unprofessionalism at once. 
Unprofessionalism the rage clouded Schmidt's thoughts. At a time like this, with bodies piling across Germany and Eastern Europe, all Speer cared about was the way he spoke. You can go to heck with your code of conduct, Speer. I will not sit in the Reichstag while... While what, Herr Schmidt? Speer practically yelled backwards, his calm demeanor cracking rapidly. I have a crisis I saved Germany from, and I cannot tolerate childish uh, tantrums. Saved by gunning down students, Schmidt asked, anger radiating from his body. I cannot sit here and listen to you turn on who we promised freedom and democracy. Do not dare say that word in this building, Schmidt uh, screamed, slamming, slamming a fist on his desk. Sit down and be quiet for once, you liberal loving dude of a man. Had he been within range, Schmidt would have thrown a punch at the decrepit Nazi, but instead they merely stood up from his seat and stormed out, leaving the Reichstags a member less, and the fuming, anxious spear glaring daggers at the man's back all the while before he left, as all of Germany watched with cameras rolling. Well, things happen. Yeah, Schmidt, Speer, oh, I mean, we basically did it, but Speer has been played, basically. Sure, I mean, social status is still zero, so there's no point not doing it at this point, right? State of the Reich, well, 84%. Actually, that's not bad. 84% is really good. And as you can see, in Iran, we're not doing that well. I'm just not, I'm only half paying attention to it because of all the events that we have to read. So at this point, like, we're not looking really good here. So, yeah, I mean, these guys are really trying to kill us off here. You guys go up there instead. The place of hatred's buff. Now, I mean, look at this. This is ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. Hold on. I mean, I'm not sure, like, if we're losing a lot of material, we're probably losing a lot of material, but it doesn't matter to me. These guys have got to be losing thousands of men by the day. Oh, this is ridiculous. This is absolutely ridiculous. I mean, we can kill them off pretty fast, but still. The place of hatred's birth. When the eyes of the Reich were focused foremost in Germania, the Reich's banner close somewhere else to strike, and one of the greatest displays of strength in the organization ever put forth. The proud revolutionaries had struck a dangerous blow to the heart of Nazism. This poorly organized swath of liberals and Democrats had seized control of the Nuremberg Party grounds. In the absence of any local resistance, the Reichsbahn had lit the braziers in front of Erin Hall. They gathered around the Erin Tribune as the leader began to speak. He had no microphone, so he had to scream to be heard, my friends. This memorial stands here today to remind us of the martyrs of National Socialism. Hitler erected this to remind us of his friends and cronies dead in their attempt to destroy democracy and freedom. The crowd roared in anger. There are no martyrs. The young revolutionary proclaimed the true martyrs of National Socialism are our friends, our family, the poor, or the sick, those who suffer under the Nazi boot every day. Every German who is alive today is a martyr of National Socialism, except those men who spent their lives preserving it. Let it be known to Hitler's architect and his cronies that this, that this first of his structures and all the others in time will crumble. The leader gave the signal and a group of men dipped their torches into Hitler's ceremonial flame. In a solemn Loxart met march, they walked through the, towards the Ehren Tribune. Let the fires of the revolution burn through Germany. Let the let fly the Reichsbahn black, red, and gold. The crowd parted as the torchbearers made their way to the monument of hatred and set it alight. Stepping back, the revolutionaries surveyed their handiwork. The flames spread from one corner of the Ehren Tribune and the structure blackened. Before they could relish in victory, the signature noise of tanks cra cracking the pavement could be heard, and the sound of gunshots drowned out the crackling and sizzling fire, and the screams of the burning party members within. Yeah, you, you stupid Iranians. Go die. Cities on flame. Oh, oh, look at that. Expanded Gebergiega's program. Oh, that's kind of cool. Vessel rested in Chancellor's study, his head wound and missing ear being tended to by Kissinger's private doctor. The Chancellor had assured him of the man's trustworthiness, but that didn't stop Gerhard from uneasily glaring at him whenever he went to produce some instrument from his bag. He attempted to piece together the recent events in his head whilst he had a moment of peace. Uh, Duch's murder had been the flashpoint, and Gerhard was now all but certain Galen had ordered it. Further still, Bachmann had been eliminated to throw a vessel off the trail. Galen's bureau had been hoarding secrets, making hidden contacts, selling information that was not theirs to sell. They had actively been working against vessels owned agents from the beginning, and to what end? And the most darning of all, Galen was extorting the fear himself. One last insurance policy in case the depth of his double dealing came to light. How had this happened? Reinhard Galen was an intelligent man. One vessel had looked up to. Now Galen had sunk to sending, him, sending hitmen after him in broad daylight. He was sloppy, out of touch, and most of all, he couldn't be trusted. Trust was everything in their business. Who to trust and distrust decided on who was alive and who was dead. He turned to look out the window and glimpsed a dull red glow. He shook off the protesting doctor and went into the window. In the distance, there were party rally grounds. The great theater in which the NSDAP had performed their ecstatic rallies ever since Hitler took power. In the center was the Ehren Tribune, the vast podium wreathed with swastikas from which he had spoke and yelled and cried, which to many represented the golden days. It was burning and time to refocus. Rise in Germany. The pride of the German Reich was damaged today as an outbreak of dissidents occurred within the very celebrations of its achievements. The annual Nuremberg rally supported the NSDAP were met with protests from the gathering groups of students advocating for free speech and reform within the Reich. However, whilst leading the protest of the student gathers, one of the students, Rudi Deutsch, was shot by Josef Bachmann, who had approached who appeared to have no government ties on account of his ideological leadership. Angered by Deutsch's death, the student broke through several barricades fighting against guards while his officers replied through force. After several days of gunfire, the riot was dispersed and the city of Nuremberg was placed under martial law by authorities. The Reichsbanner, a German resistance group, claimed support for the protests that the Deutsch's 
shooting those orchids straight up by the rack itself. On Shira Catastrophe. I'm going to kill every last Iranian here, whether we win or lose. Every single one of them's got to die. I am not standing for this crap anymore. Come on, get in there, get in there, come on. Let's go, let's go. Kill them off. Every single one has to die. Uh, no, you, you're not You're not going back. You're, whole, you're, you're attacking here. Growing and growing. Nothing was getting better. The Elm Tribune was burning and Speer could only watch. Clearly, the military police had sent... He had sent in did nothing to alleviate the anger the rioters felt. They were ambunctious fools, idealistic, short-sighted, animalistic fools. All they knew was chaos and panic, and here they were, burning down one of his most prized constructions. They were so, so many memories in that place. Glory echoed its fuel, but now it was empty. And did anything good come out of it? Perhaps one thing, Speer's realization that these fools could not be dealt with in peace. He'd given them a chance to take the olive branch, and they merely spit on his hand. Now he was in his office, and here stood a member of the gang, Minister of War, Henning von Trusco. Speer coldly called, and Trusco stood tall, unflinching, gazing at the Fuhrer with an emotionless stare. The Minister of the Interior is busy, so I'll pass this responsibility on to you. This is what has gone too far. These madmen must learn what martial law is like. Trusco shifted uncomfortably, have Speer eye. Not a second more did he continue with Speer cut in. Quickly and harshly, that was an order, Henning von Trusco, and you will listen to it. The time for playing games with your liberal demands is over. Germany burns, and I will destroy this alliance before I let this horde burn the rest down like the barbarians pillage Europe or Rome. So I advise you to listen. He couldn't see it, but Trusco's hand behind his back were clutching against each other tightly, and his finely cut nails scrapping against the skin anxiety. All right, then, he said, giving a short nod. Is there anything else you want me to do? Was Speer looking at him or through him? He couldn't tell. No, Herr Trusco, I want you to focus all your attention on this. They will learn the values of violence and discipline. The whip will crack and Speer's fist tremble, and they will learn. As a Prussian, I'm certain you agree. Trusco's face said anything but, but now go, you are dismissed. Albert Speer's architectural house of dominoes begins to fall. I mean, honestly, like, like we said earlier, like, you really do feel bad for him. I mean, he's trying his best. And then they all, and I get, like, everyone else is, like, having a really bad time. Like, you know, what was this collapsing now? What the heck, what happened over here? So all that other stuff was for naught. Well, all right. But yeah, seriously, like, he's literally doing the best he can for every single person in Germany right now. So, like, <clears throat> and to do, like, just riot? I, mean, I get it. You know, I get it. You know, I'm not, uh, one saying that what, everything here was good, but, hmm. You gotta see both sides. Or all three sides, or how many sides there are. Except the Iranian side. You can kill every single one of those evil, democratic Iranians off. Flag of a Bengun's office here. What is that? What is all this stuff? Everything is collapsing around us. Oh. Everything's on fire. Oh, the stuff? Sure, why not? You can set them stuff. Why not? Supremacy in bus? Do we get stuff done here? No? Okay. The Middle East in flames? Well, I think our own self is in flames right now, but that's alright. You know, things happen. Cool. Kill them. Seriously, just kill them. But happy 1971, everyone. Hope you're having a great year. Go, go, go. And we don't even have a focus to do right now. Yeah, you kill these guys off. The opening page. I, I'm sorry, I don't follow you, Hesh. Uh, Helmut Schmidt leaned against the booth wall, not fully understanding what he was hearing. You're saying there's a rebellion on? I'm not saying there's a rebellion. There is a rebellion. They're all over the place. The diplomat's voice crackled over the radio. The rattle of rifle fire occasionally making its way into the receiver. The fire was rapid, fast, and seemingly close. Helmut shifted as the mental, pen mental picture began to form in his head. So it's another slave rebellion. Well, crap. What? Do what we did with the last one, he muttered into the phone, a hint of confusion mixing into his normal, stately tone. No, Helmut, you don't understand. This isn't some slave revolt. The whole bad word city's up in arms. They've got Reichsbanner flags, they're chanting. Reichsbanner, a shot of excitement fired up in Schmidt's spine, quickly followed by fear. This was simultaneously very good and very bad. Crap, are you sure? We can't put this down. They've got guns, they've got ammo, I think they've stolen a few tanks. Oh, crap. The screeching of metal faintly pulsed through the receiver, quickly accompanied by the roaring of an angry crowd. Oh, uh, I gotta go. We're evacuating. Volschau is lost. Repeat, Volschau is lost. The line went dead with a slam. Helmut stood in disbelief, still glued to the phone. Finally, after a moment of silence, he dropped the receiver and rushed to the train station. This was going to be big. A new chapter in history begins. I don't know. I don't know if I like this one, this version more, or if, uh... I don't know, let's, let's also do this one, right? Um, Himmler just blowing everything up. Or I guess, yeah, I guess technically it's Himmler. There you go, good. Hey, they're trying to escape? No, you kill them. You literally kill them. The revolt expands. Oh, boy. Speer had never seen the council assemble so quickly before. Spado, Schmidt, Kissinger, Erhard, Trusco, all could tell that each of them had rushed here on short notice. Their reactions were similarly varied. Spado's calm exterior was betrayed by his deeply furrowed brow. Erhard and Trusco both seemed worried. Kissinger showed only mild interest, and Schmidt seemed to be almost excited at the thought. Speer regarded him with an extra stare before beginning, so give me a rundown. Well, mein Führer, Spado began, but was quickly cut off by Schmidt's quick talking. Mein Führer, the poles of Walsh have risen up, aided by the Reichsbanner. Apparently, this Spartacus has made his presence known there, and is setting up for a potential counterattack. 
The Polish government is in disarray. They're trying to set up a new government, but they're not having a good time of it. The rebels have gone about freeing the slaves, lifting the Nuremberg laws, repealing restrictions. So why are you so excited about the settlement? They're bad, word it all up. I've done so much for them, and this is how they repay me? I don't even know why I even listen to any of you if all you do is give me problems, Shapiro shouted, slamming his fist into the table. Schmidt recoiled, as did the rest of his gang, this was new. The sudden silence was broken by the entrance of the secretary, delivering a new report to the Fuhrer. He read it, reread it, and then threw his uh, air with a resounding bad word. Krakow is following my big daddy. Hmm, we might be able to defeat those guys here. This is still all technically connected, but still. Can you actually win there? He might be able to. Oh, that sucks. Snowballing. Look, Mind Fuhrer, I understand this is frustrating, but we cannot allow our emotions to govern our response on the issue. You should tell that to Helmut, then. That's all he's been doing for the entire time I've worked with him. Kissing his side. Perhaps he should have expected this. Spears revolt to the slave siege some time ago hadn't exactly been a resident one. Or as a resident reasoned one. In any case, Mind Fuhrer, we can't truly have an effective response until we know how far this is going to spread. It'll do us no good to try and put out these fires while more picking up. Why don't you look yourself, Kissinger? Here we are. With the plans unraveling before us, with everything the conservatives said would happen coming true, and you... And you're all standing around here preaching the merits of the Reichsbanner? Heck, Schmidt's been basically on their side since he got here, Speer snapped. I never said I was in support of the slaves, Schmidt responded. Speer turned to him with an incredulous look. B.S., you think I'm dumb, Helmut? I can see it on your face. You've been waiting for this for years. Schmidt opened his mouth to respond, but Kissinger waved him off. In any case, mind fear, we must wait until the cards fall. This is certain to get worse before it gets better, Kissinger stated, and as F to prove a point. The secretary returned, bearing more bad news. Speer groaned as he read it before. At least it was confined to Poland. Now this is going to be a total mess. The garrison is abandoned in Kiev, mind fear. All to give them opportunities of life. I don't know, this just seems like a massive betrayal. Like, really, everything we've done. The conservatives were right. But, gaining steam. The papers were co kept coming, they kept faster and faster with each passing hour. Reports of isolated uprisings in factories, slave mobs arming themselves in the re rebel holdouts. The occasional gun battles with police and soldiers. The slow consolidation of the rebels into an organized army. Every report that came in angered Speer even more and only hardened his resolve against the uh, four other men in his room. What a fool he was to trust them. Every step of the way, they had subverted his request and gone against his orders. They forced him over and over to agree with them and avoid collapse. Ever since he had brought them on, he had made his job harder than it ever had to be. And now at the hour of Germany's greatest danger since World War II, here they were to subvert him again, poisoning his ideals and dragging Germany away from what it made such power to start with. He wouldn't take it anymore, he decided. From here on in, he would call the shots, not some petty idealist or fat capitalist or some old military men. As reports of the next city to fall, the mist came in, he made up his mind. Now is the time to really show who the true power in Germany was. Him, Albert Speer, were just getting started. The past repeats. He felt tremors before, enough, but not this bad. He hadn't had the strength to open the constant flood of documents sent to his office, so his desk was filled with unread papers. He didn't have to read them, of course. He knew exactly what direction this revolt would go. They would push and push, and the Wehrmacht would push back until finally the Aryan heel would stomp down and annihilate the petty resistance the revolt gave to submitting to the new order. The thought soothed his mind a little, but he was better, still better with anger, and a certain someone kept trying to push him down another road. Mein Führer, Schmidt began, and Speer took no chance at slamming a fist against the desk and glaring at him with rageful, tired eyes. This nonsense again, he said, stirring himself into anger. Helmut Schmidt, know your place. I've spent the past two decades trying to move past web after web, and now you're constantly biting at my ankles, here and there. Who do you think I am, Schmidt? Some sort of peace-loving liberal skeleton? Perhaps you are, but I am far from such a thing. Schmidt ground his teeth together, feeling his breathing become heavier. I've advised you time and time again that clashing with the slaves would ruin our international image. To heck with our international image. You, Speer's eyes narrowed toward Schmidt. You lying in bed with the Reichsbanner, aren't you? Schmidt felt his stomach churn, and he stepped away. I should have seen this earlier. I should have realized a decade ago. You are more than just some pathetic liberal. I know who you, who you are now, Schmidt. You are a rat. A rat. Speer kicked back his chair and stood up, almost frothing in the mouth. Get out of my office. Get out, you Judeo Bolshevik dude. Get out before I have you hanged as an enemy of the state. Schmidt felt sweat drip down his back as he began walking out while Speer didn't relent. The moment I find evidence of the truth, you will have lost all use to me, and it starts with a bang. Even still, he was readjusting to his life. His new apartment, small and shoddy as it was, made the best use out of by him, and only him. Sometimes that woman who talked to him in the factory visited here and there, and they talked. They would talk about the current things happening, and she was like a source of information. He learned things outside his simple life, how the world was in turmoil, how Germany was making the sweeping change and passing his outstanding law, how they were still tre treacherous dudes, and how things would never remain the same, and how day by day things only grew tenser. Antonin knew it would happen, in fact, he was waiting for it. When he received a pair of knocks at the door, he closed the book in hands that was about the great Slavic migration into Eastern Europe, and unbolted the chain, letting it open slightly so he could look outside. Yes, his old, unused voice asked, and he could see it. Too many uniforms, and the sign of the Polish Home Army. Greetings, Antonin Grezevich. We're here on perhaps of the Free European Army. In his hands, he held a rifle that harkened back to old times. Will you fight, sir? The man's face was hard but sympathetic. There will be no work for you tomorrow. Antonin knew that well, but I can understand if you wish to remain here. Slowly, Antonin unbolted the door completely and let it wide open. He was old, perhaps even frail, but Antonin shook his head. 
No, son, he began holding out his hands. The soldier nodded and handed him the rifle. I can still fight her. He looked down and back up. Before we go, can I ask you a question? The soldier took no time to respond, even sounding a little enthusiastic, of course. Do you know a woman named Anna Slovakowska? Actually, with all the stuff happening in, in, like, here, like, do they not realize that, I mean, no Burgundy's having back down, but they could probably invade, like, or the Russians. So, I mean, like, they're dooming themselves, if, like, geopolitically, if you think, really think about it, and if Russia would actually unify that fast, and if they get this done, like, next, everything's lost. Like, they will literally put you all in chains if, under Zukov. They will literally put you all under chains. So you're just trading chains for other chains, so... Like, I get, I get the, the revolters. I really do, but... Just... I don't I don't think I can agree with revolting at this time. Especially with Russia getting ready to kill you guys. Or killing us, really. Nowhere safe. As reports continue to roll in of spontaneous rebellions, clear trends began to emerge the, from the haze. Speer reviewed them and pieced them together. A master architect building his latest work, not one of stone or steel, but one of statistics. The cities that had revolted so far all fit the same few categories. Kiev, or Warsaw, Minsk, Krakow, all were poor eastern cities. None had been successfully Germanized. Each still had a significant amount of slaves, whether personal or company owned. Finally, the major kicker at each had a normal high levels of Reichsbahn activity. Perhaps it was the relatively young demographics of each city, or perhaps it was the universities, but the pattern was clear. A plan from Spears head. This was still controllable. With the right analysis and the right plan, he could stop this rebellion in its tracks. And then revolt sees Riga, the statistics crumbled away. Riga shared none of these tales with the other cities besides a high slave population. It held a significant German minority. It was rich, even after all the chaos had engulfed Austin years ago. It not even had a major Reich's banner presence yet. Here it was, another re angry red mark of revolt splintering the Reich. Shapiro put the paper down on his desk to join the pile side and tore the rest of his analysis off the cover or corkboard. Perhaps there was no pattern to this, perhaps there was no stopping it. Time to start over. Cut them off. Cut them all off. Tidal wave. There had been one saving grace to the slave revolt its adherence to the cities. Each revolt was confined merely to the city, painful but containable. The Hale, mobilized to action by the Hale's personal order, sat in the siege around the city. A complicated standoff ensuing between slaves and soldiers, neither side willing to fire first. As long as the revolt stayed inside the urban jungle, the Reich still stood, of course. <laughs> it didn't. Uh, your scroll will just do point out. Somehow, anyway, the news spread to the slave plantations that still toiled in the countryside. One by one, the slaves found their spines, taking up arms against their masters and burning their fields to the ground. Miles met each other and became armies, tearing through the countryside and burning any slave owning slave owning home they found. Soon enough, the Wehrmacht found itself flanked and humiliatingly, humiliatingly, was forced to retreat as the country slaves dubiously met with the students and rebel rebels of the cities. As the mood out east turned joyous, the mood in the Fuhrer's office darkened. Speer slammed his fist under the table, barely suppressed in a angry yell. This was the rat dude's gang's fault. They had played with fire, and now the whole rock would burn. And this, the end is nowhere in sight. Oh, uh, something happened there. That's probably uh, more demilitarized zone. There you go. Uh, I'm not gonna change that yet. We need. We'll probably go need that PP. We only have 200 some now. So. Yeah. No. I'll be honest. Like, like I said before. Like I understand. But at the same time, like Russia, they will come and kill you completely. Oh, look at that, Billy Brandt. Should have listened to Rona or Shona or people like that. Hmm. He was going to give you peace and probably democracy eventually, but y'all just had to rise up and ruin it, man. R slaves rising throughout Muscovine. Despite its relative calm compared to the other Reich's commissariats, it seemed Muscovine hadn't been spared from the chaos of the slave revolt. While indentured servants in the former Russian lands are far less than across the rest of the Reich, they still make up a considerable number, and it seemed that the general chaos group in the entire German colonial empire has emboldened them. All across the Reich's commissariats, tens of thousands of slaves break their chains and assault the German garrisons, overseeing their suffering, taking their weapons and establishing pockets of resistance in the Russian plains. They ask for freedom, and most of them are ready to fight to the death rather than kneel once more. If they're to die, this is the message relayed to the Reich's commissariat they will die as free men. Until the Russians start knocking. Even though their numbers swell with every passing day, and local authorities struggle to protect the cities from the increasing wave of dissent, it seems that unlike the Metropolitan Reich, reaction is mounting. Reports still of German regular forces regrouping under the leadership of Feldmarschall Schorner and preparing for a counteroffensive. The general sworn to return order to the Russian Reichskommissariat no matter the cost. He can't act on his own. And out to failure. In this very room so long ago, Oberlander had sworn to keep Sch Speer in check. That was a thought that kept running through his head as men around him yelled and shouted at one another. Each much more eager to shoot down the proposals of this enemy than make any contributions of his own. The president, usually one of the most boisterous voices in the Reichstag, walked 
watched quietly as the Reich's farce of a government bickered over what to do. Speer had loosened the reins, and they had slipped from his hands. The slaves were revolting, just as dozens of party officials had expected. Speer, Kissinger, Schmidt, they had given the own to mention the rope by which to hang the German nation. If they were to survive and they were to continue, someone would have to do something. Someone yelled for silence, and there was a clamor to the dissenting voices of the Reichstag eventually simmering down into silence. When all eyes turned to him and no one spoke, Oberländer realized that they were all expecting the president to address the assembly. Faced with the results of Speer's recklessness and searching for a solution, the Reichstag was looking to Oberländer. All of Germany was looking to Oberländer. But I'm unfortunately have to say, I've got to end the episode here, in which tomorrow we'll probably end the campaign, probably the way everything is going here, in which we'll hopefully have Iran done, but we'll see what happens. Um, yeah, yeah, I don't know. With the commies here doing pretty well against, well, the Siberian Republic, I don't have a lot of hope for Germany. That if TNO2 was actually out and Zukov actually came storming in, it, everyone would be dead or enslaved. But, anyways, hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, leave a like, subscribe if you're new, check out my Discord link in the description below, and I'll see you tomorrow as we're going to continue dealing with this small, massive revolt. Thanks for watching. Have a great rest of your day.